The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off with Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in a like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The subject of our message today, the sermon comes from Luke 16, especially verses 25 to 31. My question that I want to end up with is, who is outside your gate? So we have before us a parable that you should be aware of. You've probably heard this before. I'm sure it's been preached on to you before, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, it doesn't actually call itself a parable in the text. Luke never says the word parable. Jesus never used the word parable. But most biblical scholars consider it to be a kind of generalized story. It starts out with, there was a certain man, which is the clue. Now we're talking about a general story, not specifically anybody in particular. Although the characters in this story, or parable if you will, are definitely aimed at people in Jesus' audience. And at our ears today as well. The context is important, of course. It always is when we're looking at stories in the Bible and what Jesus is teaching. The context here goes back several Sundays ago to the beginning of Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with him. Look at this Jesus. Look at who he hangs out with. Look at who he talks to. Doesn't he know these people are sinners? They're outside of the kingdom of God and don't deserve to be there? Of course, Jesus doesn't like that. Jesus came to reach out to these very people. But he loves the Pharisees as well, even though he doesn't like what they do and what they say. So he goes on to tell three parables to help them understand how God himself in his heart feels about these people that they've cast off. How precious they are in the eyes of the Lord. First, he talks about going after one sheep out of 99. Willing to leave the 99 behind to go after the one because that one is so precious. And Jesus says when they find that one sheep and bring it home, they gather together the neighbors and friends and they rejoice because they found it. Then he goes on and tells another one about one lost coin out of 10. Still very precious. Enough that a woman would sweep the house and light a lamp to find it. And when she finds it, she rejoices because she's found it. Jesus says there'll be more joy in heaven over the finding of one lost sinner than all the rest who are still in faith. Because the one lost sinner is so important to God. And we didn't read it. We will, I believe, later on in the year but then there's the lost prodigal son who takes his father's inheritance and blows it, becomes in need, no one's giving him anything, there's a famine, and finally he turns back to his father and said, this man loved me more than anyone else. Perhaps I can get on my knees and beg and he will make me one of his servants. But we know that's what not the father has in mind. The father loves his son despite everything he's done and restores him to full sonship. And then there's that other brother, very much like the Pharisees, who is jealous because of the big deal that the father makes over the lost son who squandered the money, who thinks he should no longer be a part of the family. Yet God has already declared him to be a part of his family. Then Jesus kind of switches gears a little bit. He tells a parable about a dishonest manager, one who's actually commended for taking what was, what was his wealth to manage and providing grace and mercy to those who owed debts that were far beyond their ability to pay. He's commended because Jesus' point is this man was able to use temporal wealth to bless others who needed a blessing. And his point to us as the church is we've been given temporal wealth. Not our own, but from God. And we should use that to bless others, not to provide a place for us in this world, but so that through the sharing of the gospel, the real wealth that we're given, doors might be opened for them in eternal life 
where we can banquet with them forever. From there, we go on to our parable of the day, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this parable has been used, even by me at times, to help explain about what happens after you die. It does give us some insights, but that's really not the point. The point is more in keeping with what Jesus has been talking about, how he feels about the poor and the lost and those that disregard them. And so we have the rich man, very wealthy. We're told he dresses in purple and fine linen. Those are the kind of clothes that kings would wear, the very wealthy would wear. And he wears them not just for celebration, he wears them all the time. And he likes to throw extravagant parties and banquets. We're talking the kind that would normally be reserved for a special occasion like a wedding. He throws them every single day because he can afford it and because he enjoys the extravagance of his wealth. And mind you, he would be inviting his friends to come and enjoy it with him. These are all blessings from the Lord, but he sees them as belonging to me, for my good, for my fun, for now. And who do we find outside his gate? Lazarus. We don't know what Lazarus is dressed in, but he's covered in sores. Nothing like the comfort of fine purple linen like the rich man wears. He's sitting out there longing for scraps that would fall from the table of the rich man's banquet. Willing to eat the food off the floor, but he receives nothing. This man inside has the ability to throw sumptuous banquets with food left over and has nothing to give Lazarus. Jesus paints what is a very, very sorry picture. He's placed outside the rich man's gate because the rich man is definitely somebody who could help him in some kind of way, either with food in his stomach or maybe with his sores. And don't think that the rich man doesn't know he's there. Later on we see he knows the man's name is Lazarus. He's right by the gate. He has to walk by him every time he leaves and by him when he comes in yet has nothing for him. The only one that comes and shows any kind of compare, care and compassion are the stray dogs who come and lick his sores just as they would their own. Now who is Jesus aiming this parable at? He has somebody in mind for the rich man. He said this to the uh, Pharisees at the end of our dishonest manager parable. No man can, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And how did the Pharisees react to this great biblical truth? They who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. Jesus is citing them as the rich man those that had been given much, both temporally in their wallet and also biblically, spiritually, doctrinally in their heads, yet they show no grace or mercy in any of those things to these people who they declare to be outcasts, not worthy of the kingdom of God, not worthy of their help, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. So then, of course, Lazarus. Lazarus are these men that Jesus came for. Those that are in need. Some of them in need of healing for the body. Some of them in need emotional healing. They need, spir- or need evil spirits cast out. All of them in need spiritually to be fed by the gospel. And that's why Jesus has come. And the Pharisees want nothing to do with them. Then comes the great reversal. 
the great leveler. Both men die. Lazarus, it says, is taken by the angels to be in the bosom of Abraham. Now, bosom of Abraham is kind of a Jewish saying. It means to be in the intimate presence of someone. It was often used at a banquet if you were reclining and you didn't sit on seats like that, you sat on cushions, and you would often lean against the next person. Somebody who was in the bosom of Abraham would be the one that's sitting next to Abraham, leaning on him in intimate contact. Lazarus goes to be with Abraham. And who is Abraham? He's the number one patriarch. He is the first one that is declared to be right with God because of his faith. That's why Lazarus is there. Because of his faith in God's promises. It's why the angels came and took him and why the angels will come and take you and I because we have faith in God's promise of a Messiah and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about where Lazarus was before. Outside the gate, in his own kind of torment, longing for food and not getting any, and where is he now? He's no longer outside the gate. He's at the table of the Messianic banquet, waiting for it to start on the last day, in the presence of God spiritually with his suffering gone, and only joy and happiness awaiting. The great reversal. Then there's the rich man. How about him? He's gone from enjoying a sumptuous banquet every day without a care in the world to now being in suffering, in eternal torment in hell. Suffering so much that he's looking for relief any place and anywhere he can get it. So he calls out, he says, Father Abraham. And the father part is important because that tells us he was looking at Abraham to be his ticket, not for eternal hell, but to heaven because he's one of the Jews. He's a blood, he's a blood relation to Abraham. He follows the laws. Doesn't that count for something? No. He couldn't keep the most basic law, which is love God first and others second. So here he is in the place of eternal torment. Yet he calls out to Abraham, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to bring me a cup of cool water. Knows Lazarus' name now, doesn't he? How does he see Lazarus? Not as an individual like him, not as a person loved with God, but as a servant, a slave. Send him. Send him to come and help me. Abraham says, afraid not. Lazarus' days of serving people are over. He's got his spot here in the Messianic banquet, and he will never leave it. Besides that, nobody's going to come from here to there. There's that chasm, that great big hole in the ground, that great big space fixed by God so that no one can cross from heaven to hell and no one can cross from hell to heaven. Sorry, rich man, no one, no one is coming to help you. How's that for eternal despair? Suffering. Talks about flames. Now keep in mind, Jesus is telling a parable. He's using word pictures. I don't know that our eternal hell will be flames, but it'll be torture that's physical, emotional, and spiritual. And part of that is we know that we, not us, but those that are there missed out. Missed out on eternal life. It's at this point that the rich man finally thinks about somebody else other than himself. He thinks about his five brothers. He doesn't want them to come to this place of torment because it is so awful. Father Abraham, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus back to warn them. Once again, Lazarus, his messenger boy, his slave, go send him. Abraham says, no, that isn't going to happen. Your brothers don't need anyone to come to them. They have everything they need in the law and the prophets in the scriptures. 
The scriptures testify to everything that is needed to avoid eternal hell and put people in eternal life. Of course, the rich man has no faith in the scriptures. No, Father Abraham, but if somebody was to go, and Abraham brings up the take-home point, if you don't have faith in the scriptures, nobody rising from the dead and coming to you is going to make a world of difference. For us, somebody already has. And his name is Jesus. So what is Jesus saying in this parable and what is he not saying? This is important. You understand now the purpose of the parable. Don't be like the rich man. Don't hoard all of your stuff. Look for those who are like Lazarus. We keep that in mind as the point of the parable, and there's more that we can go into. But this parable was not told as a doctrinal exposition of what happens when you die. Especially when we see that dialogue between heaven and hell, between the rich man suffering and Father Abraham in heaven. That's part of the window dressing of a parable. It's there to make it work and bring home the point so that we can hear why the rich man is suffering and why there will be no help for him. Truth is, those that will spend an eternity in hell won't see those that are in heaven. Or if they do, it'll only add to their suffering. And those that are in heaven, will they see their loved ones in hell? Lazarus never takes note of this man. Abraham speaks for God who actually is the one who knows what the suffering in eternal hell will be like. One of the take-home points, though, is that great chasm. Those that go to spend an eternity in hell, there is no chance of mercy, there is no chance of them crossing over and being in eternal life, none. And thankfully, for those that are with God, preparing for eternal life, there's no way that you will cross over and be dropped back off in eternal hell. Your eternal fate has been sealed with Christ. So what is Jesus saying? Why did the rich man go? Well, he was selfish. He did think only of himself. But I said to the kids, that, in some respects, sounds like me. And I'm sure at times it sounds like you. That's very uncomfortable. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came because you and I can't help being at times like that rich man. But he came as the God from heaven who on the cross suffered what the rich man was suffering in hell. The pain and the torment that we put upon ourselves for all the ways that we don't share what we have, we don't share love, we don't share our stuff, we don't share faith. He died to forgive every single one of those things. Suffered in your place. So you would never be that rich man suffering in eternal hell. Because he loves you. He, the one, the only one that earned his way next to, next to God at the Messianic banquet, chose instead to suffer hell for us, to pull us out of that fate, and to make sure that we, like Lazarus, on our day of death, would ascend and be in his presence as we await the last day. That's the promise of the resurrection. Christ ended your traverse into eternal hell and changed your eternal destination forever by faith. The greatest gift given to you, the gospel. Given so that you might have eternal life, given not for us to hoard all to ourselves, but to share. That begs the question to share with who? to those people like Lazarus who are outside our gate, 
who are in our very presence that need the gospel that we have, the need to hear it from our lips and our hands. People like those at Franklin Mission who, like Lazarus, need food for their stomachs, need someone to talk to, need someone to come alongside and start a dialogue with them with, by chance, we might be able to share the real food, the real strength, the real gift, which is the gift of faith. Who are those people outside our gate? Those that might be walking through our parking lot. Those that might be playing out on the playground. Moms and dads watching kids. Need us to come alongside them and just start a dialogue and see where it goes. By chance that we might be able to invite them to a fellowship event. Invite them to the harvest dinner. Invite them to worship. Where the Holy Spirit can provide them with what he's provided us. Thank God the Holy Spirit is at work in us through the gospel. He knows our frame. He knows how much we are like the rich man. He's not content to leave us there like that. Jesus tells this very parable to point us and to the Pharisees to how we are like that and to change our hearts and minds. And the power for that change is the gospel, that we are no longer condemned for our sin. Christ has wiped it away and says, go and sin no more. And you are going to fail and you are going to fall. Come back to me and receive the forgiveness I've already won for you and go forward with that great gospel message. The one that changed your heart and your mind to share my love. The one that will change their heart and their mind and give them my love. The one that can change people's eternal destination from that of the rich man to that of Lazarus. He's done it in me. He's done it in you. And through us, the church, he wants to do it in others. Amen.